Um, oops, it is not giving me the option, that which is, okay, oh, here we go, okay. Okay, um, so I'm really pleased to share with you today our work on molecular engineering, uh, which enhances the immunogenicity of self-amplifying RNA vaccines. Uh, so just a general outline for my talk, I'm going to go over some of the current challenges in vaccine development, how we use molecular engineering to enhance the immunogenicity of self-amplifying RNA vaccines. I'll also talk a little bit about the development and progress of our SARS-CoV-2 SARNA vaccine, as well as future challenges. So why do, we need, why do we need new types of vaccines? So there's really a number of um, challenges that we currently have and are trying to overcome. So the first is the lack of efficacious treatment for many devastating infections. Um, there's also the emergence of multi-drug resistant bacteria. Uh, we're also always seeking to improve the safety profiles of licensed vaccines. Um, obviously, one that's very close to home right now is disease outbreaks and being able to prepare vaccines for those. Uh, also, in general, just the changing age structure of the population. So we have people are living longer and we have more of an elderly population, um, as well as reducing the cost and time required to produce vaccines. So today, I'm really going to focus on these two um, as to how we're using molecular engineering to overcome these challenges. So the first one is disease outbreaks, as well as reducing the cost and time required to make vaccines. So I just wanted to start off with a general background for those of you who aren't familiar um, with nucleic acid vaccines. So what does that mean? So a nucleic acid vaccine is the use of RNA or DNA to express an antigen and induce an immune response. Um, so on the left here, we have DNA, which um, as most of you are aware, found in all of the cells in your body and RNA, um, which is also found in the cells in your body. So RNA is really kind of the go between uh, DNA and proteins. So the, the catch all for nucleic acid vaccines is that they require a delivery vehicle to get them um, into the cytoplasm or the nucleus, depending on whether it's RNA or DNA and protect it from degradation. So in general, there's a number of advantages specifically for nucleic acid vaccines. So um, if you look at this picture in the top left, there's kind of this um, spectrum for both safety and efficacy for all of the different types of vaccines that we currently have. So you'll notice on the right, we have replicating vectors. Um, so this includes replicating vectors as well as live attenuated viruses. So this is just a virus that has been attenuated in some way so that it doesn't infect you like a normal virus. On the left, we have non-replicating vaccines, so non-replicating viral vectors, inactivated viruses, virus-like particles, subunits, as well as nucleic acid vaccines. And what you'll notice here is that while the efficacy increases going to the right, so uh, the more they replicate really kind of the more efficacious they, is, they are, um, which really makes sense because if you think about um, viruses have evolved to really, you know, induce this immune response. And so the less like that it is, the, the less um, it's going to induce immunogenicity like a virus. But also the safety uh, increase is going the opposite way. So nucleic acid vaccines are really, really safe. Um, so the idea here on the bottom left, this picture is just kind of a general schematic of how a nucleic acid vaccine works. So we take the genetic material from a virus um, or yeah, any sort of pathogen, we copy it into an empty DNA plasmid. And so we make this new plasmid or construct as we sometimes call them. And then that can be directly injected into your muscle such that then you're the cells in your body make the protein instead of having to produce the protein on a large scale. So I'll get into that a little more later. But I just wanted to go over these real advantages of nucleic acid vaccines. So um, one main advantage is really the speed of development. So it's much easier to make than proteins or live attenuated organs in whole pathogens. Um, it's generally cheaper per dose it's really useful to be able to encode any antigen. So you can uh, make it for anything that you know the protein you need to express. They're safer due to um, the fact that they're less inflammatory. They're also generally quite thermostable. You can get post-translational modifications. So if a protein needs to have a certain glycosylation pattern, um, you can achieve that with this type of vaccine. And it's also possible to express membrane-bound proteins. 
Uh, so next, I wanted to talk a little bit more about our specific type of nucleic acid vaccine, which is self-amplifying RNA vaccines. Um, so you'll notice on the left, these are really the three different types of nucleic acids that we use. So plasmid DNA at the top, you'll notice it's double-stranded and circular, um, and the constructs we use are normally around 7,000 base pairs. The next is messenger RNA. Um, which uh, you can see is single-stranded and linear, and usually around 2,000 nucleotides, um, whereas self-amplifying RNA is much longer and single-stranded and usually around 9,500 nucleotides. Um, so for comparing self-amplifying RNA to plasmid DNA, um, it's useful because it doesn't require penetration into the nucleus, and so it makes it a little bit easier to deliver. And there's also no risk of integration into the host genome. Uh, compared to messenger RNA, uh, the self-amplification properties lead to exponentially more copies of the RNA once it gets into the cytoplasm, and this also enables higher protein expression, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, however, self-amplifying RNA, just like any nucleic acid, requires a delivery vehicle in order to promote cellular uptake and protect it from degradation. So this is the structure of self-amplifying RNA that we use. Um, and so what we have here is um, a strand of RNA that has a number of different features to it. So on the five prime end, we have a cap. And on the three prime end, we have a poly A tail. And those really help to protect it from degradation. There's also an untranslated region at both the five prime and three prime end. Um, and this helps with the replication of the RNA. Then we have these non-structural prote proteins, um, which, are, oops, which are derived from an alpha virus. And these are the proteins that form a replicase and actually help to um, copy the RNA once it's in a cell. And then downstream of this subgenomic promoter, we have um, any gene of interest. So for a lot of our studies, we use luciferase, but this is also where you would put your uh, uh, vaccine antigen in. So uh, I just wanted to illustrate here the difference between messenger self-amplifying RNA with the schematic. So <clears throat> you'll notice that once messenger and RNA gets into the cell, there's just one copy of it, and then this results in one protein being made from the um, mRNA. However, with the self-amplifying RNA, once it's able to get into the cytoplasm, it makes copies of itself. So even though one copy um, entered originally, uh, it was then able to replicate itself and make, say, five times as many copies, and you get a much higher amount of protein expression from the same dose. Um, so this is really useful just because it really allows you to minimize the dose that you use. So one of the issues um, that kind of nucleic acids have had in general is that as you are probably well aware, humans are not mice, ferrets, or monkeys. And so what we mean by this is that there's been kind of this um, issue with nonlinear dose scale up as we move from preclinical animal models to humans. So I wanted to highlight this um, study that was done by um, Moderna, which is a large RNA company a few years ago now, where they looked at their flu uh, vaccine in a number of different preclinical animal models. So the first thing they did was in mice, and their outcome here um, is the HAI titer, which is just the correlative protection for flu, um, and the higher it is, the better. So you can see here that in mice, they achieved a level of about 1,000, um, which is really good. They then used the same vaccine and looked at the HAI titer in ferrets, which is um, a really useful model for influenza. And you can see that they achieved levels of up to 10,000, which is really high. They also used the same vaccine in a non-human primate model um, and again saw HAI titers uh, of up to 10,000. So if you saw all of this data, you'd think, oh yeah, this vaccine is working quite well. Um, so you know, let's go ahead and do a clinical trial, which is what they did. So they also tried it in humans. And you can see here that then when they scaled it up into humans, um, their HAI titer was around 100. So, while it worked, it wasn't nearly as high as the preclinical animal models. Um, and this is obviously quite concerning for us because we want things to translate really well from the preclinical animal models to um, the clinical trials. So we hypothesize that this is happening um, because there's an, a different innate response in humans compared to animals. So 
Um, this is, I know, quite a complicated diagram and we don't need to go through it all today, but kind of the outcome we, that I'm trying to highlight here is that um, with RNA, it's always really balancing protein expression and adjuvantation. So once the RNA gets into a cell, um, it's, it's sensed by a number of different mechanisms. So in the endosome, it's sensed by the TLRs, so three, seven, and eight. Um, but it's also sensed in the cytosol um, by a number of different pathways, some of which we don't even have fully defined yet. And so these um, pathways are known to induce type 1 interferons, and this is kind of a double-edged sword for RNA. So it can help um, increase the adjuvanticity of it, which helps actually the immunogenicity of the vaccine. But type 1 interferons can also shut down protein expression. And so if you Obviously, if you're using RNA as a vaccine, you want it to be making the protein and shutting this down will also limit how well the vaccine is working. Um, um, this innate sensing of RNA. So the constructs um, that we're going to talk about here, so the top one is just the wild type. Um, and so this is what I explained earlier. So obviously our gene of interest down, is down here, uh, downstream of the subgenomic promoter. Um, and uh, we also made a library of what we call uh, VP2s or interferon inhibiting protein replicons. So what this means is that we chose um, a library of uh, proteins that are known to inhibit the interferon response and um, we encoded them in the RNA as well. So the idea has, here is that they're able to um, express these proteins which inter inhibit the interferon response and hopefully we'll see more protein expression because of that. So the first thing we did here um, was look at whether this, the, um, these IIPs enhance protein expression in vitro in human cells. So we used a number of different cell types here. So HEC, HeLa, and MRC5 cells. And the reason for this is because uh, we're really trying to um, yeah, screen this interferon response. And HEC cells are known to be um, basically interferon incompetent, so they don't have the complete pathway. So this is a really good control cell type for us. Um, so uh, the black here is the wild type, and then each of the different um, interferon inhibiting proteins that we've tried in the replicon. So uh, we made two different batches of these. Um, and uh, so just to make sure that the RNA wasn't the problem, so they should agree quite quite good just because sometimes you get good or bad batches of RNA. So um, what you can see here is that they were all basically equivalent to the wild type in hex cells. However, when we looked in HeLa and MRC5 cells, um, which are much more sensitive to the interferon pathway, um, you can see that there's really two that stuck, stood out quite well to us. So the first was um, the PIV5, um, so this one here in, in blue, and as well as the MERS-CoV2, which we um, also refer to as ORF4A, um, which is a little bit confusing, but just a note for the future. So we saw that these worked right quite well. So um, in MRC5 cells, um, up to two orders of magnitude higher, and in HeLa cells, up to three orders of magnitude higher. So it looked like they really were inducing higher protein expression. So we then wanted to characterize this in our in vivo systems. Um, so one of the issues that we've uh, had is um, that increasing the dose of RNA seems to really trigger this interferon pathway and shut down protein translation. So you can really visualize this here. So what we're looking at is a study that we did in mice where we give them an intramuscular injection and then see how much protein they're, uh, luciferase protein they're expressing, um, which is quantified in total flux on the y-axis. We looked at three different doses of RNA, so 0.2, 2, and 20 micrograms at seven and 10 days after injection. So what you can see here with the uh, fluke wild type is that um, we see some expression at 0.2. It's much better when we increase it to two, but then when we increase it all the way to 20, the expression drops, um, drops off again, even lower than the 0.2. So when we incorporate um, this interferon inhibiting protein from MERS into the construct, you can see that it's about the same at 0.2. At 2, it's a little bit higher than the wild type. 
and um, even higher at 20 micrograms, we're still seeing actually pretty good expression compared to the wild type. Oops. Um, and so what this tells us is that this is partially able to abate this dose dependency um, that we see, this decrease in dose dependency, although um, it didn't continue out to 10 days. It was really just apparent at seven days. Um, so we then wanted to check in our systems, um, does this same thing happen in a human tissue? So we're actually able to get human skin explants from some surgeons at Charing Cross Hospital. And we culture them into the lab for up to 21 days. And then we can also inject them just like we would a mouse, um, except we do intradermal injections, obviously. And then we can run them on flow cytometry and see how many of the cells are expressing the RNA from our constructs. So again, we use doses of 0.2, 2, and 20 micrograms. And you can see um, in this case, we're using GFP as a reporter just because you, um, this is an easier one to use for flow cytometry. Um, and on the y-axis is the percentage of GFP positive cells. So how many cells are expressing the RNA? So you can see with the wild type, it's the same trend. So at point two, we see about 8% of cells expressing GFP. Um, this increases when we increase it up to two, but then it wildly drops off when we increase the dose up to 20 micrograms. Um, however, with two of the uh, interferon inhibiting proteins, uh, PAV5 and the MERS, we see that actually this increase is preserved um, throughout. So, you know, similar levels at 0.2 and 2, but then when we increase it to 20, we don't see this drop in the number of cells um, expressing the GFP, but actually it continues to increase. Um, so we then kind of wanted to map out which cells it's being expressed in, which is one of the really cool things that we can do with flow cytometry. So um, here uh, we're using uh, TSNI, which is basically um, just a way of uh, doing unsupervised clustering of the different cell types. So uh, you um, put it into the uh, algorithm and it kind of spits out these clusters without knowing what all the gating is. So we can then look at, um, so the, the gray is what it automatically spits out, and then um, we can put uh, our GFP gating on top of it. So uh, it, the gray cells are just the live cells, and on top of that is the GFP positive cells. Um, so then we can go ahead and gate for all of the different cell types that we look at in the human skin population. Um, so including T cells, dendritic cells, monocytes, uh, B cells, Langerhans cells, leukocytes, epithelial cells, NK cells, and fibroblasts. Um, and what you can see here is that if you notice on the previous slide, so this is really the node where there's a lot of um, GFP positive cells. And with the interferon inhibiting protein, we're actually seeing that most of these cell types um, are, are expressing the RNA. So we see that in basically everything except for some of the epithelial cells, um, which is yeah, it seemed to be one of the hardest types in the human skin to, to be able to transfect. Um, so we next wanted to look at how the, these interferon inhibiting proteins uh, affect the immunogenicity. So um, we did this study in rabbits, which I thought to be a like sim similar um, immune system to humans or a little bit more similar than mice are at least. So uh, we did this with a rabies vaccine um, and using the wild type or rabies with um, ORF4A, which is our interferon inhibiting protein or another one called SOX. And um, on the Y axis, this is their antibody titer at zero, four or six weeks. Um, so you can see here with the rabies, um, they, they got an injection at zero and four weeks. So you can see an increase of the antibody titers after four weeks and then a little bit more after the boost. With the interferon inhibiting protein, we see um, it's a little bit higher um, at four weeks and then almost two orders of magnitude higher after six weeks, so after the boost. So we do see it really increasing um, the immunogenicity of vaccines as well, not just the protein expression. So another way we can characterize this is by looking at the neutralization of um, rabies with a, yeah, a pseudovirus in the lab. Um, so on the y-axis, we have the IC50 of neutralization. And again, the same groups. Um, so different time points, zero, four, and six weeks for rabies, rabies with the interferon inhibiting protein from burgers and socks. 
Um, so what you can see here is that after four weeks, they're about the same. And um, after six weeks, we see again about two orders of magnitude oops, higher for um, the rabies with ORF4A in it. So the conclusions from this part are really um, that the interferon inhibiting proteins um, enhance luciferase expression in human cells that are known to have an intact interferon pathway. As far as the dose dependence, we see that the interferon inhibiting proteins rescue detrimental effects of um, increasing the dose of RNA in mice and human skin explants. We also see that they, uh, interferon inhibiting proteins enhance expression of RNA in resident skin immune cells, um, as well as enhancing the immunogenicity of an saRNA rabies vaccine in rabbits. Um, so now, a very close to home for everybody, <laughs> um, enter COVID-19. So we then were able to quickly repurpose this vaccine, vaccine platform that we've been working on to make a SARS-2 um, coronavirus vaccine. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about how we did this. So um, we took, uh, once the viral sequence was available, so it was um, sequenced and then made publicly available, so we are then able to identify the glycoprotein on the surface of it. We take that protein and encode it in um, self-amplifying RNA. We did this in the pre-fusion stabilized S spike form. Uh, we then encapsulate it into lipid nanoparticles and inject that into mice. So I wanted to really highlight kind of the amazing thing about RNA vaccines in general, which is that they're really quite quick to make compared to a number of other protein or uh, viral vaccines. So um, the circulating strain was sequenced on the 10th of January. We accessed it on the 20th of January, and then we're able to order the DNA oligos on 22nd of January after designing the protein that we wanted to encode. Uh, we assembled the genes on the 28th of January. On the 12th of February, we were able to confirm the um, vaccine extraction using flow cytometry. Um, and just making sure that the protein was actually being expressed, which is great. We then started immunogenicity studies on the 13th of February. We started our toxicology study on the 30th of March, um, which is really kind of the final thing that we're waiting on before we go to the regulators. Um, we submitted our paper last week, so 22nd of April, and then plan to start our clinical trials in June. But what you'll notice about this is that um, from the circulating strain being sequenced to starting the clinical trials is about a five-month span, um, which is incredibly quickly to be able to make a vaccine, which is yeah, just really one of the advantages of nucleic acid vaccines in general. Um, so I wanted to also walk you guys through a little bit of the data that we um, submitted uh, our publication last week. Um, so I guess the main question you have is, is the vaccine working? So this is a graph looking at the SARS-2 specific um, IgG, so antibody titers in mice. Uh, the times we looked at was two, four, and six weeks. So these mice received an injection um, at zero and four weeks. It's our kind of standard schedule. Uh, we had a number of controls in these. So uh, we used electroporated DNA as a control just because we know it works really well. We used um, a different, so rabies RNA, just because it shouldn't induce a, an immune response to uh, SARS-2. And then we used a number of different doses, so 10, 1, 0.1, and 0.01 micrograms um, in our LNP formulation. So you can see a really nice dose response here, um, and actually really quite high antibody titers, even from our lowest dose of 0.01 micrograms, um, which is really great and really promising for our clinical trial. Another cool thing that we were able to do is compare um, the responses that we see from the vaccine to patients who have recovered from COVID-19. So that's what we have in light blue here at the end is the antibody titers from patients that have already had been infected with the virus. Um, and so we can see how much natural infection induces antibody titers. And you can see that even at our lowest dose, um, our vaccine is inducing higher antibody titers than found in people that have recovered from, uh, from the virus. So our conclusion here is that our vaccine induces a higher quantity of antibodies than a natural infection. Uh, but there's kind of a secondary part of this. So um, how functional are these antibodies, right? So we're able to also develop a neutralization assay 
uh, for this. So again, we are comparing um, the DNA and the rabies control uh, compared to the four different doses, so 10, 1, 0.1, and 0.01 um, in our lipid nanoparticle formulation, and then again against patients that have recovered from COVID-19. So you can see here that again, we're getting really high neutralization, that's great. Um, even at our lowest dose, it's again higher than uh, the recovered COVID patients. So what we can conclude from this is that the vaccine-induced antibodies are able to neutralize the virus better than antibodies from recovered patients, which is really great. Um, a couple of other kind of like minor things that we've looked at here is whether um, the antibody response is TH1 or TH2 skewed. Um, so this is just important if you've heard about um, the ADE, which is uh, antibody dependent enhancement. So saying that there are times when um, certain antibody levels have been shown for coronaviruses to enhance the uptake um, and infection of vi these viruses. Uh, so we wanted to just characterize which, which way um, it skews our, our antibodies based off of the vaccine that we've developed. So we've looked at both of IgG1 and IgG2A titers. Um, and you can see here um, when you divide the IgG2A by the IgG1, so this will tell you Th1 or Th2 skewed. So if it's above one in this case, it's Th1 skewed, um, which we have for the DNA as well as all of our um, lipid nanoparticle formulations, which is good because a TH2 skewing has been more associated with ADE. So the next thing that we wanted to look at um, is the uh, cellular responses. So uh, in this case, we took the splenocytes from mice that had been vaccinated and re-stimulate them um, with peptides from, from the viral protein. And what you can see here is that um, we actually see a pretty good response from DNA. So this is, this is kind of what's normally considered a good response actually. Um, it's like somewhere between like zero and 200. But in the lipid nanoparticle formulations, um, we saw upwards of you know, between 1,000 and 3,000 for all of our samples. So we're seeing really high cellular responses as well, which is really promising. Um, so you might be wondering, when will the vaccine be ready? This is kind of our current path to the clinic. Um, so we have, um, our, we're currently working on our preclinical package, so doing the animal studies and toxicology. We're then planning on doing a dose escalation study in 40 participants starting in June, um, so just to hone in on what is the correct dose to be using in people. Um, and then we'll go on to look at the safety and immunogenicity in a wider population of 100. Um, we then are planning to do efficacy studies starting in September of 5,000 people and then um, implementation hopefully starting in December of this year for 20 million people, which is really exciting. So um, kind of to end it, uh, I wanted to talk about just kind of the challenges that we've had with this um, and also going into the future. So. One of the things that is really great about RNA is that it's actually fairly simple to make the vaccine. Um, so if you think about how do we make vaccines, so protein and viral vaccines are made actually in, in ways that require a lot of resources. So um, this is just a bioreactor that you would use to grow cells to make either protein or viral vectors. Um, another way we make it that's also, you know, really not as high throughput is the way that we make the flu vaccine. So this is making fl flu vaccines in 1957, um, but also in 2020. So we still make them in the same way. And often these are some of the reasons why it takes so long to produce vaccines. Um, however, for RNA vaccines and specifically for self-amplifying RNA, we can make them with a much smaller footprint. So um, here we have a, a hundred milliliter batch can make a million doses. So you can imagine it's much easier to scale this up when you're trying to think about globally, globally vaccinating billions of people. Um, it's just a, a much more scalable process. Um, but that even being said, I got a call from Robin a few weeks ago and he said to me, I'm struggling to figure out how we're going to make 5 million doses, which is um, a lot <laughs> for, for any one institution to be doing. But um, how we're actually doing it is the RNA is made in California um, and then a company in Vancouver called Acutus makes the lipids for us. Those two currently are then shipped to Austria where they're put together into the formulation. That formulation is then shipped to the UK where it's put into vials for the clinical trials. 
So what you can see here is that it's not really a centralized process. And I think this is one of the main challenges for the future. So um, currently, if you think about it, there's you know kind of like these four larger plants all over the world that specialize in one part of it. Um, and you have to really rely on them and the scheduling and um, being able to make them GMP. But I think for the future, like what we're really going to see is um, a transition to having kind of smaller, more mobile production plants for vaccines like this. So um, obviously this isn't a, a direct representation of how many would probably need. And as you can tell, I got tired of copying and pasting this as I got to kind of the Eastern part of the world. Um, but I think it's, it's a much more, um, easy way, especially because RNA had such a smaller footprint that you could actually be making these locally and, and you know, different countries could be making their own vaccines, um, which is, I, I think, actually a much more useful thing for outbreaks just because then, um, and if, as they're happening, you'd be able to, to produce a vaccine for them. Um, so our conclusions here, um, our SARS SARS-2 immunogenicity is starting to look really good. We see higher antibody titers and neutralization than the natural infection in recovered COVID-19 patients. Um, we're set to begin our phase one clinical trial in June of 2020. Um, and I think one of the main challenges here that we're going to have for the future is really making this modular manufacturing of RNA vaccines. Um, and I think that will really just help en enable a global response for future outbreaks. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful team that we have working on this. Um, so specifically Robin and the team in our lab, um, Acuitas, who do all the formulations for us in Vancouver, as well as the surgeons that we work with at Charing Cross Hospital, um, Liz and Jude. And with that, I will take any questions. Um, so I know I can now go to the Q&A part. Let's see if I can get that. Oops, I'm gonna leave that up. One second. Okay. Sorry, I was having having trouble getting um, the Q and A up. Okay. So um, yeah, some really great qu questions here. So uh, the first one is that I can see. Sorry, guys. Um, the first one that I see is that um, somebody asked, what is an adjuvant? So an adjuvant is really a way of just waking up the immune system. Um, and so it's kind of a way of telling your virus, obviously it's, it's uh, there's lots of proteins that are in your body. And so to make it recognize a certain protein, especially when you put it in with a nucleic acid, you have to really, um, yeah, you have to kind of like wake up the immune system to it. So an adjuvant is kind of the way that we do that for vaccines. Um, the second one is what is GFP? Um, and GFP is a green fluorescent protein. So it's just an inherently fluorescent protein that we use for flow cytometry. Um, the third question that I see is, uh, hi, thanks for the great talk. Do you think the availability of plasma DNA could be a bottleneck? If synthetic DNA is used, would the enzymatic process be a bottleneck in terms of raw material availability for the very large scale manufacturer at, at, at um, epidemic scale? Um, so yeah, the availability of uh, plasma DNA could be a bottleneck. Um, so we actually, for some of the clinical trials, we're actually making it in-house right now. So we have kind of like a, it's called like a pre-GMP classification. Um, so yeah, it, it could be, although it doesn't seem to be a bottleneck right now. Um, so typically we get about 100 micrograms of RNA for every one microgram of DNA that we put in. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely something to think about. Um, so the next question here is how are they going to work with the coronavirus? So I would say, yeah, I think our data shows that it's, it looks really um, promising so far. So we think it's going to work well. This, you know, as scientists, obviously we want to have um, optimism, but skepticism as well. And so um, we don't know how it will go in humans, but we think the data from our preclinical studies looks really promising. 
Um, the next question is, did you ever look for a correlation between the interferon response um, diminishing in the presence of PIV5 or MERS? Um, so we haven't, I guess I'm not sure exactly what the um, correlation you're talking about is. I don't know if you want to, um, yeah, expand on that, but uh, yeah, so we, we have looked for, we really kind of just use like the protein expression as kind of a um, proxy for that. So we haven't measured interferon directly um, in the presence of PFA of Hive or MERS, although we have planned to do experiments like that. Um, so the next question is, could you possibly expand on what HAI titers are? Uh, yep, so HAI is hemagglutinin inhibition. And so this is a way for flu vaccines that they found to be a correlate of protection. Um, so basically in the SARA, you should um, be able to uh, inhibit hemagglutinin um, between red blood cells. And so it's kind of just a standardized assay. It's probably 50 years old at this point that people use to standardize that between it. But um, kind of the better, the higher the HAI titer, uh, the better that the vaccine is working, if that makes sense. Um, so the next question is, is the extremely high and robust interferon gamma response not a worry to trigger a cytokine storm of some sort? Um, so yeah, I see what you're saying here, and obviously um, we wouldn't want that just upon injecting RNA, but that was actually in response to re-stimulation with the peptide. Um, and so I don't think it would be necessarily like a cytokine storm in the body. It's really just a measure of how good is the cellular response to, to the virus. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's like should be okay in my mind. Um, let's see. So the next question is, um, what's the plan if the trials don't work out and the vaccine doesn't pass the safety or efficacy studies? Um, so obviously we hope that doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, I guess the plan for us then would be probably to go back to the drawing board and um, probably tweak the formulation or think about um, how to make the immunogenicity better in humans. Obviously, this platform has never been in humans before, so we don't know how it's going to go. Um, but we're hopeful that, yeah, it's going to work. Um, let's see. There's a lot of questions here, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer all of them. Um, let me look through them, and I'll see if there's some more good ones out there. Okay, so there's a few more. So um, this is a great question. So I was wondering how easy it is to ensure RNA quality when scaling production. As you mentioned, you can get good and bad batches. Is this a problem and would you hope to be solved for decentralized manufacture? So that's a really good question. I think the um, QA, QC of RNA right now is um, really difficult because it's kind of an, an undefined feel as far as, as far as kind of like qualifying batches. Um, so we do this in a number of ways, which are actually kind of archaic almost. So we do it based off of um, a gel electrophoresis. So just seeing the band of RNA and then also um, there's kind of two different like potency assays that we can do. So one is just a simple transfection. So making sure we see as much protein expression as we would expect. And we can do that either via Western blot or flow cytometry. Um, so this is definitely an issue when thinking about scaling it up. Although I think usually the, the main issue is just getting the same yield that you do um, and not losing too much of it in the purification as you scale up your batch sizes. Um, another question is, have there been any examples of saRNA vaccines working in humans? Um, so they haven't yet been tested in, in humans, um, but messenger RNA vaccines have been tested in humans, and they're, they're pretty similar except that self-amplifying RNA should let you use a smaller dose of RNA. Um, so a company in Boston called Moderna has really kind of pioneered the mRNA vaccines in humans thus far. Um, so they were actually the first ones to start clinical trials for SARS-2 as well in, in Seattle. Um,
Oh, this is, this is a really good question. So uh, when you were looking at the publicly available DNA sequence, how did you recognize the glycoproteins? Are there some telltale signatures? So is this, um, this is actually something that I think um, we got really lucky with, with this virus is that it's actually uh, genetically quite similar to both SARS and MERS. And so when the, um, sequence was made available, there's a lot of conserved regions before those. And because people had defined previously um, the glycoproteins for SARS and MERS, they were just readily identified really on this virus. And so because of that, we were able to target the sequence for the glycoproteins. Um, so that was kind of, yeah, lucky for everybody who's making COVID-19 vaccines out there. Um, let's see. Okay, lots of good questions. So I'm going to answer a few more. I think we still have a little bit more time. Um, so it says, does the RNA vaccine get degraded at some point or does the target protein production ever stop? And if, how quickly? So this is actually really interesting for self-amplifying RNA. So it does get it does get degraded at some point and it does stop producing protein. Um, so we've seen protein expression out to like 60 days um, in humans or in mice, sorry. Um, and we don't really understand why it stops ever. Um, so I think that's something that's, yeah, really worth looking into in the field. But at some point, at some point it does get degraded and stop producing protein. We just don't really understand why. Um, someone else asked, would you be able to adapt your vaccine if there is a mutation in the virus strain? Um, so yeah, that should theoretically be possible as long as we know, um, yeah, what the new glycoprotein we'd need to make is, we could easily make that into our, into our vaccine. Um, uh, yeah, just as long as that sequence was available to us, it's really easy to adapt. That's one of the main advantages. Um, let's see. Um, so there's another question that said, I just want to know if there's any way of telling how long the immunity will last. I know there are some issues over long-term antibody protection with other coronaviruses. Um, so we don't know yet. We're currently monitoring this in the mice, but also as our clinical trials will go on, we'll start to um, monitor this in humans as well, just because obviously it would be great to have really, um, yeah, really long-term immunity. Um, but we we would also, you know, it would also be okay if it was the type of thing where you had to get a vaccine every year, um, just like kind of like a new flu vaccine or something like that. Um. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. Um, thanks everybody for uh, attending today. Really appreciate it. Um, Leah, are you going to? Cool. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much, um, Anna, for the great and informative presentation. Um, we're sorry, there were so many questions. Um, really yeah, sorry. no worries. It was great. I just had to kind of pick and choose. So sorry oh, that I didn't answer all of them. Um, so the recording of the webinar will be available on the IMSI YouTube channel soon. Um, so thank you again to Anna, that was really great, and thank you for everyone for attending um, our first webinar, it was a really good experience. Um, so next week we will hear from Dr. Morgan Beebe on the subject of understanding bacterial evolution using 3D electron microscopy. Um, so I've put a link to all of the upcoming webinars in the chat function, as well as the link to the briefing paper also. Um, so please make sure that you register in advance to come to these webinars, and thank you all for attending. Thank you very much.